replace the capacity? Can any or all of these replace the capacity that we've lost for covering the machinery of democracy? Uh, and with that, I want to turn it over to one of the people who is trying, and that's Sharon Broussard. Um, Sharon is project manager for the Northeast Ohio Solutions Coll Journalism Collaborative. Um, it was the first coll such collaborative in the state of Ohio, modeled after a very successful one that's going on that's been going on in Philadelphia for several years. Uh, the Solutions Ohio, Northeast Ohio Neo Sojo, as they call it, is based here in Cleveland, and it's a partnership of 18 local news outlets that have come together um, to write about solutions to longstanding regional problems. They are not all nonprofit entities that are involved. There are some, like the Eye on Ohio Newsroom, as, as an example, but there are a number of other entities that are small, independent, for profit news outlets. Um, the Collaborate itself covers Akron and Kent, it, and its members involve uh, broadcast stations like WKYC, uh, Kent State's radio station is involved, um, The Land, Freshwater Cleveland, and a number of other news outlets you may or may not have heard of, because many of these are small. Uh, Sharon is a former editorial writer for The Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com. Uh, she brings a lot of experience to her role as the project manager for Neo Sojo. And Sharon, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, great. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the history lesson about what's going on with newspapers today <laughs> to kind of refer, get everybody on the same page about why a lot of these experiments are happening. Whether or not they're going to be successful, you know, I think time will tell. But they're definitely in response to the shrinking um, news ecosystem here in Greater Cleveland. I want to say that it's a very long name, but the Northeast Ohio Solutions Journalism Collaborative was started um, by exploration of two um, plain dealer folks, actually, George Rodrigue and Kathy Seaman Long, who were um, part of the shrinking, they could see that the plane dealer was about to shrink and you know, go into the fold of cleveland.com. And they started talking to local news, part, local news outlets out here and asking them, well, what do you think if we would bind together to do a collaborative, focus on one thing that you guys all wanna work on that you can't work on now, you don't have the resources, you don't have the reporters available, you don't have, uh, photographers and videographers or the other things that you need. But what if we all got together and said, okay, we're going to drive one theme forward and work on that. Um, so they went around, talked to a number of different shops. Um, some said yes, some said no, some said maybe. Um, they uh, some kind of way reached out to Solutions Journalism Network, which is based in New York City. And that's an organization that has been setting up collaboratives across the nation with the idea that, um, you know, folks can't do everything they want to do on their own, but what can they do together? And they're, they were one of the sponsors for the very successful multi-million dollar Philadelphia collaborative, which is probably, I think, in its fourth or fifth year now, which binds the um, Philadelphia major newspaper, a couple of television stations, and a lot of hyper locals. And they're all working on something um, broken Philly. So their idea is let's work on economic mobility. What are some of the barriers to that? What can be done about that? What are other cities and towns doing that are better? you know, fit than what we're doing here in Philly. So based on that idea, they got funding from Solutions Journalism Network to come to Ohio. So that's how we got started. And that was two years ago. Um, we had an issue in mind here and then COVID struck and we became <laughs> very COVID focused last year. Um, so, uh, you know, in the last two years, we uh, last year, uh, we wrote some great stories about um, utility, utility resources, um, you know, how a lot of people were struggling to pay their water and light and, and uh, sewer bills. And, you know, we came up with a guide to help people figure out like where they can go to pay some of those bills. There are programs out there, but it's all kind of the information on them can be kind of disjointed. So we put it all together. Uh, Rainbow Hospital social workers picked up on that because they didn't have a, a central place in order to find that, you know, in writing to help people um, do that kind of thing. Um, wrote stories about um, the lack of bilingual contract tracers, uh, contact tracers here in Cleveland. 
Um, the idea being that, you know, if you spoke Spanish, for example, nobody tried to, you know, talk to you and find out who had you been around, you know, after you had COVID, like who had you seen or sat next to or that way they could call them and said, hey, you know, please get tested. Uh, so we pointed that out and, and, you know, in Cleveland, that got a pretty good response. Um, also black churches and how they were doing on the vaccination. Actually, they were doing fantastic because a lot of the pastors knew people and could talk to them honestly and say, Hey, you know, this is something you should do. And we're offering here at the church. So we did those kinds of stories this year. We moved into economic recovery. Once again, COVID surprised us <laughs> and said not quite an economic recovery, but we decided that we would focus on rent utilities um work the the work people getting jobs and that kind of thing um and um transit so those are the three buckets that we now look for stories in and we've done a, a really good series the land has been handling that but it's collaboration with a lot of other um, news partners as well on eviction prevention and the various things that other cities are doing to keep people in their homes i mean in their apartments usually you know as much as possible um, the expansion of digital c which is trying to bring internet which is so needed here in cleveland as you know um, that's what you know school kids found out and people who were told to work at home but you live in you know some neighborhoods where that's just not possible because you don't have great internet ex access or it's too expensive um, so, um, and water affordability. So we're back to the utilities thing since that was so, you know, successful, you know, we, uh, went down to Philadelphia and talked to them about a system that they have going on to help people who are poor pay for their water bills, you know, which involves discounts and things like that. Um, so we're going to explore that and have a community zoom sometime in March as well about that. So um, basically our motto is, you know, what is it you can't do alone, but you were interested in doing? And if you had money, because we do pay our freelance writers or freelance photographers, if you want to hire a, a videographer and a graphic artist, you know, we have funding for that. So what is it that all of us together can do better than one of us alone could do? So that's kind of um, what we bring to this. Um, it's been an experiment, you know, a lot of the news outlets know of each other and read each other, but they don't necessarily have never spent time around the table or on a Zoom, <laughs> which is what we have to resort to, um, you know, talking and meeting people and asking them like, oh, well, you're working on that story. I'd like to work on that too. And, you know, uh, I have a photographer, you know, you want to use photographers. So, you know, there's been a lot of that going back and forth. You know, we had um, one partner who needed help with um, his internet. And, you know, I put it out to the group, like, you know, he, he just needs a couple of things here and there. Could someone call him and talk to him? And they did and, you know, walked him through, you know, and gave him a hand there. So there are now folks that people can call upon um, to help them with their projects. So, and some of those projects have to do with our major theme and other projects are, you know, people are now just sharing stories. Like I, I wrote X story, you know, would your publication, uh, you know, would your digital outlet like to use it? So there's some sharing on, going on there too. Um, we're looking into our third year. We're trying to figure out, you know, what do we want to be when we really grow up? Um, but it's been a very interesting experiment. You know, it's had some ups and downs, um, you know, like all of these things that that's kind of the interesting part of what happens when a major industry dies, then the idea after that is like what springs up from, you know, the ground. And this is a lot of springing up, a lot of people trying a lot of different things, some that might be here for decades and people say, oh, why didn't they do that years ago? And others that are, you know, going to wither and die and maybe turn into something else. But that's kind of uh, where we are and what we do. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Sharon. I have a couple questions for you later. I know you <laughs> but do. First, but first, I want to uh, introduce Jim O'Brien, our, our other panelist. Um, Jim is infamous. Uh, he is an entrepreneur with a background in print, photography, and design, um, working with uh, Lakewood Library Director Ken Warren. He founded the Observer Media Project uh, about 17 years ago 
with a mission to create a low cost, sustainable way for communities to have a newspaper. Uh, and more importantly, as a depository for the stories and the images and the conversations that help build and define a community. Uh, the Observer Media Project, which includes the paper that I help run, the Heights Observer, uh, that began with a single outlet in Lakewood, and it now includes independently operated newspapers serving Cleveland Heights and University Heights, Parma, Euclid, Collinwood, uh, Bay Village and Westlake, and there always seems to be one on the horizon. Uh, so with that said, I am going to let you hear a little bit from Jim and see what he sounds like this morning. Jim? Bob, um, I believe you covered everything. I have nothing else to add to it. That was a fabulous I presentation. That. I doubt that. <laughs> um, a little history on the Observer. About uh, 20 years ago, uh, we had noticed that major media outlets came to Lakewood to report bad news. If it was a broken down house, Lakewood was near downtown Cleveland, so they'd come up and show a broken down house. So in an effort to rebrand the community and create an organ that would fulfill the needs of a community, we sat down over two years to figure out what exactly it should look like. The only thing we cared about from day one was sustainability. In my mind, a project that is not sustainable in news falls afoul of many things. And it also hurts the community in the long run. Now, back to the news problem we're talking about today. I don't necessarily agree with Bob and his wonderful presentation on the death of media and how it happened. I would say the biggest thing to happen would be Wall Street discovered media. So instead of turning a three to 6% profit, they demanded 10%, 15%, 30%. And for newspapers to respond, they did all the wrong things. I'm gonna ask you to think about the rest, your neighborhood restaurant. They open up, they give you big portions. It's a wonderful place to go. Things get tight. They cut back on service. They cut back on quality. They cut back on quantity. And before you know it, they are out of business. I am saying the, the same thing is going on with news media right now. You have the search for money, which made people cut staff. And the easiest staff to cut were the big money writers. These were the people that came to see stuff. I never read about fishing, but thousands of people in Cleveland did all the time. And it's these little anchors that define a newspaper and a media project. At the same time, we also have media now using Facebook, Twitter, other things to reach out and bring people in. I would venture to say it brings in less than what they spend on doing it. I have noticed too many people spending too much money on social media that it ends up a dead end for a lack of a better term, especially in getting verifiable news out, which is all that should really matter to a community. I will agree with Bob about uh, Craigslist putting a knife in the back of the one thing that made almost all papers in this country sustainable and with the ability to tell any single advertiser, no, we're not gonna print that, we're not gonna run it, or yes, we are gonna run it, we don't care what you do. Once they lost that, you start losing independent news. Everybody becomes, everybody in the newspaper business, everybody in the nonprofit business, all this, become very dependent on the people that are financing them. Nobody is willing to go against the big dollar. What we try to do here at the community paper is build up many little advertisers and a sense of community ownership. You might not like the news today, but you probably will like it two weeks down the road. And we've gotten a tremendous amount of buy-in on that. Growth was going very well. The Observer ran into a story about our local hospital that was being sold out from under us. And um, we took it on. 
At the end of three years, we had gotten over $250,000 in legal fees, but we had won four court cases, which allowed us to eventually prove that City Hall was selling it for dollars of what, matter of fact, the whole hospital went for $1 in the end, although it was valued at $283 million. My question is, to the panel down the road is, how are you going to make up that need? I mean, it's easy to talk about non-confrontational issues. It's easy to be a cheerleader for the good. An example, we all love new condos going up, but what happens to the indigenous people in those communities? These are people that have lived and invested in those communities for decades. Why would we want to leave them behind? Why would we become just a cheerleader for change? What I'm seeing now on the news horizon is diffusion. Diffusion is the enemy of any community. You need a focal place, a focal point. In the old days, and I'm very old, we would have like Walter Cronkite, which at least gave you a singular post to discuss news from. Now you can find anything anywhere to back up whatever lame brain idea you have and bring it into a, a discussion. 99% of social media treats all opinions as valued opinions. That doesn't move us forward. That doesn't move the community forward. If it's not gonna move the community forward, I have zero interest in it. These are the problems we have to address. How is one paper gonna get funding? If there's 75 papers out there doing it. When we started here in Lakewood, there was no Facebook. Today, there's over 35 websites just dealing with discussion in Lakewood. I fear um, the bull is out of the barn. I don't, don't know how we're gonna get back, but I hope this discussion takes us down that road. With that, I go back to my good friend, Bob Rosenbaum. Thanks, Jim. This is not the first time Jim and I have disagreed on anything. Um, <laughs> So I wasn't at all surprised to hear that. And I, I actually agree with a lot of what you said, especially the Wall Street thing. I do have a question for you, Jim. Your, your, one of your complaints is that uh, you, you view nonprofit journalism as fundamentally unsustainable. It's, it's asking for handouts. Um, and at the same time, your big concern and what you, you place as the downfall of for-profit media is the profit motive and Wall Street getting involved. So how do you reconcile those things? If, if, if big money is going to ruin media and asking for, for um, nonprofit donations isn't going to save it, what's, what's, how do you reconcile those two things? Well, I had the pleasure to talk to Sharon for a couple minutes yesterday. I, I would love to speak to her more about it. And in the middle of the discussion, I thought, oh, PBS is working. So there's been a sustainable nonprofit project going on for a long time. However, without the, the two one-hour news shows on PBS, is it addressing what we need? Sesame Street, sure. But what about the hard news? This is the problem. The other problem that I see, not necessarily with the nonprofit, is the fallback on how many news people are using social media as a news story, which is just absurd. This goes back to Trump, where it's like Trump tweeting is not news. Trump not tweeting would be news. So I, I do have these. The, the problem is, and Bob, you know this, I've dealt with a lot of nonprofits. I've had a lot of nonprofits want to get involved with this. At the end of the day, they all want more than I was willing to give. And this is the single biggest fear I have, is the powerful people in a community, because I can't deal with national stuff, but the powerful people in the community leaning on the reporters. And I have many, many stories of this happening. So if, if Sharon is an example, 
if Sharon's funding dries up, which we hope it never does, what happens to the content? What happens to what's going on? What happens to the future? What happens to all those people? Of course, it just disappears. But is that the sustainable model we were looking for? Not at all. I'd rather build it up with small advertisers that understand what they're buying into. That's the key, I think. Interesting. Thank you, Jim. And Sharon, let me ask you a question. This, is, this kind of goes in a different direction. Um, journalists are competitive beings, or at least historically, as we know it, they've been very competitive. When I, when I came up in daily journalism, um, there was an outright animosity between the journalists from other papers that were covering the same beat that I was covering, um, to the point where sometimes we would feed each other baloney stories or tips and um, try to misdirect each other. You're working with journalists from 18 outlets. Some of them are, are fairly large and highly visible. Um, WKYC, I don't know if Channel 5 is still involved, um, but I know early on Channel 5 and WKYC weren't sure that they could be involved in the same collaborative project together. So I guess my question for you at this moment is, how are journalists getting over that hump and are they getting over that hump? Are they, are they able to collaborate? Yeah, I, I think that they are able to collaborate. I mean, you start with the premise that everybody agrees to do X story. In this case, I'll just take the rent thing that we're doing. Um, <coughs> excuse me, um, eviction prevention. Um, from there, you know, you sign memorandums, you all agree to work together, excuse me again. <coughs> you all agree to work together on that one story. Um, Communication is key, and you kind of go from there. Um, WKYC does participate, but not the other station. Okay. Idea Stream is our second biggest um, contributor as well. But you know, it all starts with the spirit of collaboration on this one particular area. They may compete, you know, anywhere else they want to, and they do. I'm, I'm not sure this follow-up question matters, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are they collaborating because of financial pressure and panic, or are they collaborating because they want to do good in the world? Well, I think for the, you know, for the biggies, it's kind of more goodwill than it is about, you know, financial pressure and panic. I mean, Idea Stream, I think, is in a really good spot these days with this absorption of WKSU and making it a bigger thing. And, and I think the television stations are fine. So I, I think it's the idea that appeals to them more than we have to do that for the smaller publications. You know, it's a way to get new stories that they can't do on their own into their publications. So it's a way to add more content to readers where, you know, which they may not be able to, to do on their own, so. Okay. And, and before I throw it back to Susan for our q and I just want to ask you one more quick question, Jim. Um, the, uh, this concept of diffusion, I, I've heard it from you often. Maybe you can go just a little bit more into that. How does social media harm community? And um, as kind of a follow-up, your forum, your bulletin board is, is a strong and vital part of the Lakewood Observer program. How does that differ? How does that not diffuse, cause diffusion? Um, again, I, I think we all know the nightmare of social media right now is we all are good meaning people who get on every morning and we're going to check our email and we're going to go to work and we're going to do whatever. And you know what? I'm going to look at Facebook for a second. I'm going to hit Twitter and you're down the rabbit hole. As I said, in Lakewood, there's 35 different places to get community information. God bless them all. But they all disagree about everything. Not to mention the level of hate that exists out there, which just is turning people off in record numbers. What we did is start a forum. It's not as active as it used to be because Facebook has taken a hit out of it. But everybody signs up. Now, you got to remember, this is 20 years ago. Everybody signs up using their real name, and they're all accountable for what they say and do. We have gone to court. We have seen other people go to court to defend what they said. 
this is the way it should be. We're on the Facebook groups and some of the other stuff. It pops up. They do it. I had a, I had a well-meaning teacher who is loved by the community that would get drunk and just come after me like a dog on Facebook. On the deck, he was the teacher we all loved. These are the problems. You, you, you can't bring a community together with 35 different people pushing agendas and opinions. And I would say, and you know this, Bob, you're a rare one on this, 90% of the people that get involved in this are doing this to hammer home their point of view. They don't care what you think. They want you to think what they think. And they use, they, 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 they start their little forums. They start this little thing, gather momentum, whatever. They'll come up with one hot piece of news, blow it up so everybody comes in. And all they care about, the hits, all they care about are the likes. Those of us in the business, there's not a penny to be made there. There's no sustainability in that. Mm -hmm. These are just people st stumbling through the community. This is the diffusion I talk about. I'm not sure we can ever get it back in the bottle, but it's killing our communities right now and should be addressed. That's it. Very good. With Thank you. And Susan, I promised you you'd have something interesting to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, well, thank wait, you. Did all. I miss something? Uh, no, thank you all three. You. Uh, you you've really set the stage here for a wonderful Q and A or question and answer session. Um, and I know I speak for uh, for many others when I say we really really appreciate your expertise and your sharing uh, the details that uh, kind of behind the curtain that we would never have known otherwise about uh, local newspapers, including uh, of course nonprofit newspapers. Anyway, it's now time for questions and answers. And please use the Q&A button on your computer or your smartphone and type in your questions and comments. If your question is chosen, uh, we'll recognize you by your first name unless you hit the anonymous button. Um, and while we're talking about computer buttons, I just wanna mention the chat button. Uh, if you are not on our forum reminder list and want to receive information about future upcoming forums, please put your name and email in the chat box button and we'll put you on the list. Um, I'm now going to turn this over to Ken Fries and Debbie Wright, uh, members of our forum committee and co-chairs of the Q&A session. Um, they will choose the questions and uh, that, that, that we will discuss and they will coordinate the discussion as we move forward. So thank you again. Thank you, great talk, I'm very impressed. So uh, we'll start off with the first question here. Um, I think your first name's Beth. Um, wonderful comment on the problem of too much choice. Is there any way to solve this situation? Not sure that going to court is the real answer. And then just an add on to that, how is I as the audience, how do I find all these local news? and weed between the too much noise and the ones that are really doing something. And I'll leave it up to whoever wants to answer. You all can address this. I don't see any way to put the internet back in the box and social media. I mean, it's out there now. Young people have embraced it, you know, far more than we have. And it's just part of, you know, their, their bread, and, bread and milk these days. So I don't know, I, I guess one of the things that we can do is just kind of keep having, keep staying alive as much as possible and keep having our voices out there so people know that there are more reliable local sources, those who are interested in that, because some people aren't, you're right, Jim, some people just wanna be in that echo chamber and mostly hear their own voice. So it's a struggle, not just for newspapers, it's a struggle for democracy, you know? Because the, the big lie would not be the big lie without, you know, so many forces, yeah. <coughs> so many ways of um, picking that up, you know, through social media. So I'll, I'll, I'll add to, uh, you know, talking about the, the choice, the how too many choices. Um, there have always been too many choices. When radio came along, everybody was afraid that that was going to kill newspapers. 
uh, when TV came along, we were all afraid that was going to kill radio. Cable came along, we were all afraid it was going to kill TV. And the internet came along, and here we are 25 years later, and it hasn't killed TV, it hasn't killed radio. It's doing its best to kill newspapers, but you know, I think we can all agree that depending on which side of the political divide you're on, the Washington Post and the New York Times are the either the grand heroes or the grand villains of the Trump era. Um, so they too are still doing their job doggedly. Um, so choice never gets less. We are, it's, it's just like the layers of the sandwich just get compressed tighter and tighter and tighter until I guess to carry that metaphor through to its logical conclusion, you end up with a panini. Um, but we're there. I mean, we have, we have a lot of choices and we have to live with a lot of choices. What we have also is a lot of people who are very, very uneducated and unsavvy about where the information comes from on those various choices. I, I would throw in that the way to get rid of some of the diffusion is to be the central point of truthful information and impartiality. And this is something you build up throughout the years by proving it. You earn the respect that you get always. It's, uh, it, it, way, it comes and goes here in Lakewood, depending on which political force is in town, but you treat them all the same. We all get dressed the same. We all eat. We do everything the same. There's no hierarchy here. The one caveat I'd put on that is if you're an elected official in Lakewood, we are always open to your point of view and want you to frame your point of view. They've earned that through the election process. That doesn't mean we can't hold them accountable. That would be the biggest change out there. Um, although legal ways aren't the way to do it, the observer, I always joke, the observer has more lawyers than writers just because to make sure what we're doing is copacetic legally and to help us take on some of the tough issues. We're battling a pollution issue that I'm not really going to go into but we needed environmental lawyers. We need this. And we're able to get them to step up. It's very good. But to me, you earn the respect. And we all have to go back to earning the respect. Thank you. I'll go back to that. Uh, my part, the other, second half of my question is, like, how do I, as a reader, even know you exist? I live in South Euclid, as an example. And I just saw the Heights Observer for the first time doing research for this talk. I've only been in Ohio for seven years. So how, how do I find that you exist? You know, it's. Sharon, I think that one's in your, in your territory. Boy, I don't know. I mean, I know my publications, um, a lot, some of them are digital, like, you know, the land, for example, in Freshwater <laughs> Cleveland. So you would find them online. Other ones have been, you know, at least before COVID, um, trying to get their publications out to local stores, the public library, um, mm -hmm. other, other civic centers. I mean, kind of have to keep your eye out for them. But once again, you could also find them online, <laughs> which is the bane of our existence, but also <laughs> where, you know, if you had typed in South Euclid newspapers, you know, then that one might come up, so. Yeah. I, I'll add, I, I think that question gets to a um, really vital issue, which is, you know, exactly how do you find them? We've got a bunch of small publications trying to work together. Um, none of them are marketeers, by the way. They are all community-minded people who, mm -hmm. who really care deeply about what they're covering and less they care less about, about banging their own drum. Um, and that's an issue. And I think that's something that I, if, if there were a nonprofit solution to anything, I would love to see that something very visible come that they can pull all the best stuff that's coming out of smaller organizations and make it visible. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would, I would say the best way that we get out is through both word of mouth and the internet. It's a combination of all these things where somebody moves to a community and they say, you've got to check out the Lakewood Observer. These guys are, are cutting news that nobody else is reporting. It's those kind of things, plus reaching into the community. Since we've started the Lakewood Observer, we've had over 7,000 residents write, photograph, or take part in the Observer. 
This gives the community buy-in. They don't want to see their project die. They don't want to see. So now they're broadcasting what is out there. Um, I mean, there will always be people that aren't aware of it. Such is life. What can I say? Okay. And did you have a good question? Okay. Uh, I'm looking at um, what Sharon said about uh, web web interface of information with the community. And as you as you pointed out, there's web access and problems with that. But uh, with that being said, uh, how do people in the community, um, how, how do they keep up with what's happening in the community with fewer reporters, journalists, and of course, uh, web access, which limits accessibility to information. Do you, do you want to comment on that, Sharon? Because it sounds like your collaborative is bringing many people together. Yeah, uh, that's that's a difficult thing, especially if you lack internet access. I know that we did a um, interesting text message project. It was to teach people about public records. And we know that a lot of people have cell phones, even though they may not have computers. And this was a project that sent you a text and said, okay, this is how you get a public record from City Hall. And it taught you in like four or five different little lessons, you know, what, what's a public record, what's not, you know, um, how do you go about getting that record? You know, what do you have to say in the document in order to get city officials to, you know, say, oh, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I've got to comply with the law and send this document. So we've done that kind of experiment. I think that we need to do kind of more of those to reach people who live in internet, you know, deserts of some sort. I know that some um, in Oakland, California, there's a publication that, you know, will send out a text to you about what news is happening in your community. And they also write stories as well. But the idea is to reach those who, you know, only have a cell phone in order to find out what news is, which is a shame these days because obviously, you know, you need a lot more, but it's, it's a start at least. Just, just a comment, just my personal comment, but it seems that our current, the current mayor in Cleveland and other initiatives before him, <clears throat> we're trying to get uh, internet service for like $10 a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's maybe a beginning, but I don't know what people's budgets are. Maybe $10 might be iffy. I don't know. Yeah, we um, just wrote a story about the expansion of Digital C. That's uh, one of the big internet projects in Cleveland. And they are trying to offer, you know, low priced internet. They need some money. They're hoping to get some from the American Rescue Plan. But we just wrote a story about, you know, what their hopes and dreams are around that and you know, how people, you know, you know, how the fact that you don't have internet makes it harder for you, obviously, to find a job or do schoolwork and, you know, things like that, even apply for social security, which you can do by mail, but which is much easier, apparently, by, uh, by email. Thank you. Um, can I jump in for a second? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, the, the internet's huge, the internet's our future, but so is printed media. I mean, I can go through stories and stories and stories of people picking up a 2000 word story and taking a day or two to read it, um, to immerse themselves in it or establish you know, a series of stories, which certainly can be done online, but online, they can't use it for insulation. They can't use it to wrap their fish and garbage in. They can't use it for lasagna gardening. They can't put it inside their pants to stop chafing when they're bike riding, an article we actually did in my bike newspaper, um, and how to make hats and recycle papers. Um, there's always going to be people left behind. The question is, to me, this question is, the news the community needs to survive as opposed to the news the community wants to read. In other words, a, a good example is a high school baseball game. There's a certain group of people that really want to read it, but does the community need it to survive? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's good. I, 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 I have two newspapers get delivered to my house, the Plain Dealer and the uh, Sun News. Hard to get that Sun News. 
they're not easy to subscribe to it. They, they don't, their online links a couple of years ago didn't even exist. But anyway, um, go on. <laughs> uh, it's, it might uh, be no the last one. Sure. <laughs> What's <might> that? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. So an anonymous attendee asked, what can this group tell us about the new initiative announced nationwide this week, the American Journalism Project, and specifically the branch in Cleveland? Is that something you're aware of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're all aware of it. What's gonna happen and when is something that, you know, we're not, I'm not at least privy to the details, but apparently this has been tried in some other cities as well. Um, I understand they were gonna hire as many as two dozen reporters. They're supported by most of the foundations, it seemed. Mm -hmm. The Foundation and St. Luke's and a number of others are all mm -hmm. putting money into it. Um, sustainability, you know, nobody knows, but- um, So it's it competing with existing, it's competing with existing news media then? It, oh, um, I'm not so, I don't know. I don't know if they're I, gonna be, sharing and collaborative or not, because last I heard they had not hired top leadership that will help give this beast some direction. So I, can anybody I, else I, fill in stuff? I can, I can add a little bit of uh, background to that. The American Media Project's big claim to fame is the Texas Monthly, which um, it's like, if you remember back in the eighties, Midnight Basketball was working to get oh, yeah. gang, reduce gang violence somewhere in some big city. And that program got some national press and all of a sudden now every city had to have its midnight basketball program. Mm. The Texas Monthly has been um, a resounding success in Texas. And all of a sudden that is the model that big money seems to wanna to pursue when it comes to saving democracy through, through nonprofit media. It has six, over $6 million behind it coming into Cleveland none of the partners have disclosed how much each of them has contributed to it, but the total right now is about 6 million. They are trying to hire their leadership locally. And if you look at the information they ask about or that they put in their job application, a big, big piece of it is funding. They wanna find people who will be um, professional, dedicated, ongoing fundraisers. Uh, mm -hmm. So my guess is it will be funded in the long term if it gets funded. And this is Jim's one of Jim's big objections. It will be funded through grants and donations. Can I jump in now? Please. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing how Bob gave me that beautiful opening. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is the news and media presence in Cleveland right now is a total mess with diffusion and hundreds of little projects, literally hundreds of little projects. They are now climbing over each other to try to get this injection of funding that is supposedly coming. To me, it was like a bunch of kids playing in a sandbox, finally getting their little castles built and all that. And then the big kid comes in and busts up all the sandcastles and goes, no, let's do it this way. The amount of ripples it is causing that are hurting some publications, it seems they don't care about. I would even venture to say that they probably don't care overall about Cleveland's news, or they'd find a way to inject that into cleveland.com, which has already established so many of these things. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me let me throw in here about, you know competition, people leaping all over each other. If you read about news in the 1800s and 1900s, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. there were, I worked in New York at, you know, in the 1980s. And do we have like four or five major newspapers and who knows how many hyper local ones? Mm -hmm. Some of those survived, some of those didn't, but that was just kind of the nature of the beast, which went back to the ugly competition that we sometimes <laughs> face with, you know, re, you know, five reporters on, you know, like, one one mugging or something along those lines, which I worked at the New York Daily News and that was the bread and butter, muggings, robberies, all that crime stuff. So um, I think that's just part of the beast and has been for can, you know, can I, decades. Can I jump in here for a second, Sharon? Sure. I agree with what you're saying and thank God we're not in the 1800s for many reasons. Many. But 
as I see nonprofits come in, and this is my mindset, we touched on this a little bit the other day. What I see them doing is taking news media and turn it into the Cleveland Orchestra, which is not a bad thing. We love the orchestra, but how many or other orchestra members don't get in, don't get paid, don't exist because of what I see as an unfair advantage. I would say it is like someone owning a driving range and the city deciding to open a driving range right next to you. It makes it almost impossible to compete on a fair mm -hmm. level. We pay, when we hire freelancers, we pay generally more than the going rate. But somebody with six million to throw around, where does that leave us? And this is what I worry about. I don't mind, matter of fact, the only way media is gonna succeed is organically. It has to build its foundation. If it is gonna rely on the injection of nonprofit funding all the time, then we might as well call it a museum, a news museum, because they're gonna end up printing what the benefactors wanna see. All right, no, I'm sure they're gonna hire news people who draw the line at that. Just as you draw the line with your advertisers and say, you know, I'm gonna cover what I think is right. But I think the other point is that, um, you know, you got to let all the flowers bloom. Some of those flowers are going to wither. Some of those flowers aren't going to make it. You actually have a great niche. You're not telling me that that group or local media association, whatever, are, are going to be in Lakewood every single day covering all the important things that you find. I think that you're actually fine because people might want to read about what the bit wider community is doing. But if they still want to read about what Lakewood is doing and what Lakewood cares about, they're going to go to your publication. I wouldn't go to the other one for that. <laughs> one, one more word on the American Journalism Project. Sorry, Jim, I'm jumping in. Um, there's no question. I don't have any inside knowledge, but there's no question just from seeing what I've seen and the coverage of it. They are coming in as the 800 pound gorilla. They want to have an impact and they are coming in really to take on cleveland.com directly, not necessarily to, to put them out of business and not to compete with them on a one for one dollar for dollar level, but to say, you have not been doing the job this community needs. So we're going to come in and we're going to help. Um, with respect to some of the many small local media, the American Journalism Project did reach out at the very beginning of their exploration and asked a group of local media outlets if they would be willing to have the American Media Journalism Project here. Um, and those outlets had an interesting conversation about it, but I, I think ultimately there's a lot of people who run small media who hope to get a piece of that $6 million somehow, <laughs> and I think they're dreaming. I, I think that $6 million is going to go to build a local newsroom that doesn't currently exist and build a news gathering infrastructure. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think it's a good thing, but if you are in the other, if you're already in the me media community here, um, it's not necessarily going to enrich you. Well, who, you. who provide, who is the money behind this $6 million? I mean, who, who is it's it? Foundations, local foundations. The, um, the American Journalism Project is a nonprofit. They own the Texas Monthly and they're funded by very wealthy people who I don't know, but who- That's what I mean. So it's very wealthy people who- It is. How they it should be run. They tend to be those people of conscience um, right. to the degree that you can be once you've amassed a billion dollars. Well, you know, and whose conscience is it? That You got to ask the question, but- and, and emphasis of the news, is it going to be national news or is it? It's you know, going to be local for what I understand. And Columbus also has been thrown in there. But uh, like I said, a lot of our local foundations, the Cleveland Foundation and uh, several others are have ponied up money for this. Mm -hmm. as, as, I, as I promised Bob, I wouldn't say, but I'm about to say, I will be fascinated when this group reports on the failures of Public Square and the Reader's Line, mm. that will let me know they're independent. When they actually do the stories about the gentrifications of Cleveland neighborhoods and the displacement of the indigenous people, I will know that we can trust these people. Until then, I've dealt with a lot of the foundations we're talking about. None of them want that stuff out. They want a rosy picture. 
I will go to Freshwater. I, I, I don't read it all the time, but I've never seen what I would call a hard hitting story in it. It's mm -hmm. usually talking about how this money did this and this community got funding from this people and it's all good, which needs to be out there. But that is a propaganda piece. That's not a news piece. Well, let me say um, I work with Freshwater closely and let me say that, you know, they're not they're kind of more featurey. They're not, you know, necessarily interested in, you know, hard hitting investigative pieces. There are other people who do that, but they are interested in, you know, featuring our um, community and what's going on. So, I mean, different publications have different missions and not everybody's going to be the but 60 Sharon, minutes of news. So Sharon, wasn't Freshwater brought by a foundation? I actually people? don't know. It's beginning. Yes, yes, they were. I'm quite familiar with the, the, the whole thing. I won't go into it here, but I'm quite familiar with the whole thing, but it was brought in. When we were losing our hospital, and, and that's the story that mattered to Cleveland or Lakewood, because it's, it's left us devastated. Freshwater's doing story about the new popcorn shop that opened. That's a distraction. That's a magic trick. Look at my left hand. Don't look at my right hand. Well, this I think is what I can deal with what I fear at the same meeting. time. What I say, I think people can deal with two things at the same time. I read feature stories all the time, but I'm definitely going to read about Lakewood in the hospital. Oh, it doesn't mean I ex I'm excluding one or the other. That's what I'm saying. I would say that most people can read more than one story and focus on one thing at the same time too. But if the sky is falling and somebody else says, "No, we've got caramel popcorn." You get a lot of people go, oh, I like popcorn. I don't like the falling sky. Mm -hmm. This this is, I mean, and, and to me, I'm sure you understand this. Bob, I know, understands this. The beauty of papers is that people are almost forced to look at stories they don't necessarily want to look as the other story they want to look wraps around the other one. Do you see what I mean? It kind of leads you through. So even if you're not a sports fan, you might find out the scores because it's on a page where a story was continued over. Right. Okay, enough of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a good discussion. I like the back and forth on this because, because to me that they, these are the issues of news, like how what gets in there and what's missing from in there. Um, uh, let's see. I'll just ask. I, I, I haven't <laughs> listened to you so hard. I haven't been listening to looking at my questions, but. I'll, Got, grab this one here. Can we cross the digital divide more quickly by waiting for investments in broadband to provide upgrades only or providing or also investing in Lakewood to deliver Lakewood Observer and print on every porch in the Lakewood on their bikes? I guess that's going back to the old way of delivering news, the kids with the bikes. I don't think they do that anymore. But, I'm here. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. What was the, what was the question? Um, I'll read it again. Uh, the, the digital divide? Yeah. Can we cross the digital divide more quickly by waiting for investments in broadband to provide upgrades only, or by also investing in Lakewood kids to help deliver the Lake, local observer in print on every porch in Lakewood on their bikes? So we, we used to have a pr program when we started out where we actually paid kids 10 cents a house to deliver there. And then they were they asked the home to get 25 cents an issue. We deliver, we're out every two weeks. Um, the program was somewhat successful, but over the course of two, three years, people would combine paper routes. Um, the kids delivering the paper got to keep the quarter. We didn't get any of it. This was a way for them to earn money. And some of them got very ambitious, then left for college and the program slowly imploded. In other communities, like in Cleveland, we had worked with the Cleveland police about training people to deliver papers and look for trouble signs. In other words, papers stacked up on a porch, mail unanswered, a broken mm -hmm. window, whatever. Um, that got kind of stillborn in a, in, a, in a switch of management down there and, and looking at another thing. Um, the digital divide, I mean, this is where I, I differ from a lot of the other people I work with is, Cox is one of our advertisers, and we've worked on a couple programs to create bubbles and free access in Lakewood, and also to pass on discounts to Lakewoodites 
so that they can get online. Um, I'm not sure how we ever jump over the digital divide in so much as we all go through the nightmare of having to upgrade everything every three months. And so I'm thinking that even if you get a government phone or whatever, you're still gonna end up being three, four months behind. I think this is where a print paper kind of allows you to scrape the crumbs onto the paper before you throw it away. That's it. Okay, Ken, do you have a question? Well, I, you know, I'm kind of looking at a number of questions here that are similar. Uh, one question came uh, regarding uh, rural and uh, urban papers. You know, is there a difference between uh, how they how they survive or their demise? Now, I grew up in this is off question, but I grew up in the Chicago area and they had two papers and now they're down to one, which is run by Wall Street. And it basically it's worthless. That's the Tribune as far as I'm concerned. And in Cleveland, when I came to Cleveland, they had the Cleveland Press and the Plain Dealer. And now the Plain the Press is gone. The Plain Dealer is uh, shrinking to electronic media. Uh, I, I guess the question is, uh, how does news get out with uh, the demise of all papers? Many people, regardless of cell phones, internet, still like a newspaper. I subscribe to two, The Plain Dealer, which is okay, and The New York Times. But The New York Times, in many cases, is a unique paper because it's um, it, they're well-funded. Um, but locally, how do you get to everyone with news in your community, because we don't always need national news. But comment from anyone, Sharon, Jim, Bob, I, whatever I, you think. I, I think that kind of turns the responsibility around. The, the responsibility of news organizations is to deliver the news, um, but it's the responsibility of people who support, of, of everyday citizens to seek it out and to find it. Um, now, I know there's a question hiding in here about the unsavvy media consumer, of which I think most, most media consumers probably are. Um, if they don't want it, and if they don't seek it out, there's no way you can give it to them. Uh, we have to have that, we, we must have that people want to get the real information. I think that's a bit of a crisis too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would agree. I mean, the one thing I would say is that in newspaper form, you can deliver it many different ways, everything from a broadsheet, in other words, one page printed on both sides, if it's a small town, to 80 pages if it's a larger town. One of the things we do at The Observer is we let our finances kind of dictate where we're headed. I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to be sustainable. That's our, that's our goal, gather the news and be sustainable. Uh, I agree with Bob. Um, I'm sure Sharon will too, that if a person doesn't want the news, there's no way you're going to get them to read the news without holding them down. Yeah. Okay, I think we've had a wonderful discussion here this morning. Um, we might have time for one more question, but I think it's best since it's 1040 here that we really kind of wrap up. Um, and uh, I do want to thank each one of you panelists for your expertise, your commitment. Uh, we've had a wonderful discussion this morning on, on local news, journalism, our current challenges, uh, what might be coming down the road and, uh, and in trying to keep an informed electorate for our democracy. I think uh, th these are all very important, uh, very important principles. So uh, I do have some upcoming announcements that I wanna go through quickly. Uh, this form has been recorded and it will soon be available on our congregation's website, uucleveland.org. Uh, our next forum is on Sunday, February 6th, and it's titled The Pandemic and the Inflation Outlook. Hmm. Our speaker is Robert Rich, the director of the Center for Inflation Research in the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. So, um, uh, we'll learn more about inflation and all the multiple impacts it has on our lives and so forth next Sunday at 930. So 
One other quick reminder, again, if you're not on our forum list and you want to receive a weekly email reminder of upcoming forums, um, please give us your name and email address in the chat box button, where you can go online and see the whole um, selection here of upcoming forums at uucleveland.org. And <clears throat> I want to mention that our forums this winter will be virtual only. Um, and we do want to invite all of you to our 11 o'clock service this morning. Uh, Reverend Randy Partain's uh, uh, talk will be on the fifth Unitarian principle. Um, <clears throat> it will be the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Um, our service starting this morning is both virtual and in person. Inside our, our sanctuary, we have, you know, uh, we have uh, clearly marked social distance seating and everyone must wear a mask, all of those things, if you want to join us in person at 11 o'clock. But the service is also online. Again, if you go to uucleveland.org, you can uh, click on <clears throat> the YouTube icon, or you can also go to our Facebook page, uh, Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. So uh, we do uh, appreciate your continued support uh, and uh, look forward to many more discussions uh, and, and including next Sunday uh, at 9.30. And um, we just wanna thank you again for all of your your uh, work on and help and commitment to, to keeping our forums uh, uh, lively and informative and education. So thank you all again. And with that, I will say goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Great, great, <laughs> great conversation. Yes, it thank was. You. We appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much.